Hey, Malicious Life listeners, a quick word before we begin. We've released about 30 episodes in 2019 out of a total of 70 episodes in the podcast so far, and that's quite a lot of episodes, and sometimes with such a wealth of available options, it's difficult to choose what to listen to first, especially if you're a new listener. To make things a bit easier, we added a page to our website with a list of some of our favorite episodes of 2019. So if you're a new listener, or if you wish to recommend the podcast to a friend, this might be a good place to start. Check out malicious.life slash read. That's malicious.life slash read. And now, on with the show. Happy New Year! Hi there, listeners, and welcome to the 2020s. Aren't new decades exciting? The promise of new beginnings, new technologies and fixes to all the problems that plagued our past 10 years? Are you feeling hopeful about a bright, happy future ahead? Well, that's nice. Enjoyed that thought. The kind of malware we're talking about in this first episode doesn't paint such a rosy image of our future. Not only is it one of the main threats facing cybersecurity in the 2020s, but it just might be that nothing we have ever talked about before on this show, not WannaCry, not Shamoon, Comficker, nor Stuxnet, can compare with the vast destruction it can cause. Welcome to a new decade of Malicious Life podcast in collaboration with Cyber Reason. I'm Ran Levy. Today, we'll be hearing about the most important malware to ever hit industrial systems. Its name is Triton slash Trisis. Have you ever seen a petrochemical plant? They are massive constructions, like small cities. And they're incredibly complicated. Buildings and structures connected to other structures intertwined with other structures and endless steel pipes running in every which way. How anybody thought to build such a convoluted thing and how anybody actually understands what it's all for is, frankly, beyond me. Petro Rabe is one of these giant labyrinth plants. It's located on Saudi Arabia's west coast, right along the Red Sea, just off the halfway point between Mecca and Medina. It's like some kind of a futuristic robot city. 3,000 acres, tall metal towers surrounded by six or seven story tall structures made of steel pipes and beams that make them look like the metal skeletons of buildings half finished. With all those pipes, it produces around 5 million tons of petrochemical products every year. It's difficult to imagine how a single piece of computer software could have any kind of effect on such a massive place. If you were to have visited Petro Rabe on a Saturday evening in June 2017, hardly anything would have appeared wrong. June happened to be the month of Ramadan that year, so it was even quieter than a normal Saturday at Petro Rabe would otherwise be. The only event of note occurred when, without warning or explanation, a section of the plant shut down. The shutdown had been triggered by a safety system. No real damage was done, but it was strange nonetheless. So a team of specialists was called in to investigate the cause. The team ran some tests, then brought the safety device back to the laboratory for further inspection. The tests turned up nothing. The device seemed to be in fine working order. The shutdown must have been some strange one-off glitch, they figured. They were, of course, wrong. But it's hard to blame them. What was actually going on, just under their noses, had never existed before in the history of cybersecurity. (music) 
But we're going to step out of our story for a few minutes now, because the kind of security that's practiced at the petrochemical plant is characteristically different from the security we typically talk about on our show. It requires a different skill set, really an entirely different mindset than working in IT does. So here's the deal. For the next 20 minutes, I want you, listeners, to forget the lessons of cybersecurity you've come to know. We're going to put on a different hat. Only by thinking like industrial systems engineers will we begin to understand the nature of why that Rabe system was taken offline on that day in June and why that incident was the tip of a much, much bigger iceberg. Are you ready? You've got your new hat on? Good. I'm Andrew Ginter. I am a Vice President Industrial Security with Waterfall Security Solutions. I work with some of the most secure industrial sites on the planet. Andrew Ginter is one of North America's leading voices in industrial security. He co-hosts a podcast called The Industrial Security Podcast with the senior producer of our show, Nate Nilsson. The fundamental difference between industrial cybersecurity and classic sort of enterprise cybersecurity is this. In the enterprise world, we seek to protect the information. We protect the confidentiality or the integrity or the availability of the information. Usually, confidentiality is the highest priority. When I work with the world's most secure sites, they tell me their number one priority is not protecting the information. Their number one priority is safe, correct, efficient, and continuous physical operations. And because cyber attacks come in information, this is the definition of cyber, keep the control system running, keep the physical process running, and integrity is important too. We have to keep it running correctly or there's no point. We're talking about what's at stake here. In industry and manufacturing, you're not just protecting data, but machines, big, hulking, powerful machines delivering the materials necessary to a functioning modern society. All cyber attacks are information. Because cyber attacks come from information, what we need to do is protect physical operations from information. Every information flow into the control system is a potential attack vector. A comprehensive list of these information flows is a comprehensive list of attack vectors. We need to eliminate as many of these as possible and thoroughly discipline the rest of them. So not protecting information, but protecting physical operations from information. This point is crucial. If a hacker shuts down a corporate IT network, it's a big deal. In fact, we've got a whole class of these kinds of attacks, denials of service, that everybody hates dealing with. But industrial security engineers aren't only protecting equipment from information. They're also protecting humans from equipment. Plants process highly combustible, toxic, electric and otherwise volatile substances. And if you've ever heard of Chernobyl, you don't need me to tell you why it's important to keep industrial machines happy. My first language is German. In German, it's the same word, Sicherheit. It means safety. It means security. And so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of confusion. But um, fundamentally, physical safety is only possible in computer-controlled processes if the control system is secure, if our, if our enemies, if our attackers cannot tamper with the control system and impair physical safety. To protect human lives is a heavy burden to bear. It is the burden of those who handle the computer systems, but also kinetic security personnel at the physical site. You can't get past the gates at a place like Petro Rabe without heavy security checks. I had the privilege of visiting a refinery a number of years ago. Um, when I came, when we drove up to the refinery, I mean, this is an impressive artifice. This is an uh, artifact. It's, uh, it was seven stories of pipe, you know, as from, from one horizon to the other. It was a massive installation. We drive up to the security uh, booth and... 
the usual happens. I mean, we all file out of the car. We show our passports to the uh, the folks in the, the booth. They take pictures of them. They give us cards. And then things kind of get a little strange. And I couldn't figure it out. They made every one of us file through a turnstile, badging in, except the driver. The driver could go back to the car and drive the car through and badge into the uh, the facility um, when he drove the car through. We were not allowed to get back in the car and hand our badges to the driver and get badged in. We had to physically badge in ourselves. Then we could, on the other side of the of the security fence, then we could get back into the car. And, you know, this was strange, and, the, you know, it, it continued strange. Nobody checked the trunk of the car to see if anybody was hiding inside. You know, it just it just seemed odd. And so I asked my contact there, I said, this just, I, I'm not, I can't put my finger on it, but it seems weird. The priorities seem weird. And my contact there said, you don't understand. The security, the physical security program here is part of the safety program. The reason they asked us all of those questions about where we're going to be and who we're going to be with and what we're going to be doing and are we going to be walking around is because they want an ironclad count of where everybody is in the facility at all times. If there is an industrial incident at the facility, they will risk the lives of rescue personnel only if they know there's someone in the area to save. They're not going to send personnel into a dangerous area if they don't know that there's anybody in there. So it's vital that when you're walking around the facility, every time you see a badger, you badge in. If somebody's hiding in the trunk, they're on their own. In addition to safety procedures like badging, there are actual machines that are specially designed to save lives should anything at a plant go wrong. Industrial engineers, plant operators, managers and their families only sleep well at night if these machines work perfectly, 100% of the time. And no machine is more fundamental to safety at an industrial site than the safety instrumented system. A safety instrumented system is a, a little computer. It has one job. It does one thing all day long. Uh, it's got a program inside that reads all of its inputs. So the, the, this computer is typically physically connected to between you know, 50 and 300 um, sensors in the physical process. The sensors measuring temperature, pressure, flow, um, this kind of thing. And the program has one job. Check all of the inputs against a calculation that determines if the facility is still running within safe tolerances, within safe limits. If the answer is yes, there's only one output from a safety instrumented system, yes or no. If the bit is yes, keep running the process. If ever the process, the physical process, deviates from safe parameters, send out a no and trigger an emergency shutdown, an immediate emergency shutdown. The safety systems are designed to protect human life, not protect equipment, not, you know, keep the, the process running and continuously and efficiently. Safety systems have one job, and that's to, pretend, er, to, to prevent casualties and to prevent catastrophes, if you like. Now you understand why a team of specialists had to be called into Petro Rabe in June 2017. It wasn't necessarily what happened that was so catastrophic, but that a safety instrumented system, a machine designed with the sole purpose of protecting human life, was the thing which caused it. The vendor looked at the logs, looked at everything, and determined it was a mechanical failure. They didn't say in what, I'm guessing, in one of the sensors. So they made the repair, they, they brought the site up. You know, when I say brought the site up, uh, it's harder than that. If, 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 a, if a large refinery trips, it may be a week before it's back at full production. This is a very expensive event. So it tripped, uh, there was some diagnosis, the, the verdict was mechanical, uh, there was repair, and the process was, you know, the, the facility was sooner or later brought back up to full production. After the initial check, everything appeared to be normal. Life went on. A month later, it tripped again. People started getting suspicious. They brought in investigators. They said, what's going on here? 
on August 4th, 2017 at 7.43 p.m., two emergency shutdown systems automatically clicked on. All the while, plant operators had no idea anything was amiss. Once they discovered the shutdown, they entered a state of emergency. They were right to do so. In the IT space, two cybersecurity events in two months is nothing. In the industrial security space, it's a huge red flag. In need of urgent assistance, Rabe called in a response unit from Saudi Aramco. Aramco should be a familiar name to those of you who listened to our episode on Shamoon, the malware that took out all of Aramco's computers in 2012. What we didn't have time to get into in that episode was how immediately, how thoroughly, Aramco transformed their security postures in response to that incident. Turns out that losing your entire IT infrastructure and having to buy 50,000 hard drives all at once is a good motivator to invest in cybersecurity. The company hired a team of specialists to rebuild their systems from the ground up, and clearly by 2017, they still hadn't forgotten their lesson. They had world-class specialists on call to dispatch to Rabe, a company which they own a 37.5% stake. These were the experts that finally figured out what was going on. Their initial clue was a pattern of strange communications between the Rabe's IT network and some operations workstations. That there even was a line of communication between those two networks was itself a problem. Industrial plants have multiple distinct layers of computer systems, each with their own function. And not all of these layers are supposed to talk to all the other layers. Just picture a layer cake, a really great layer cake with all kinds of flavors. There's vanilla on top, then caramel, then mocha, then chocolate on the bottom. They're all stacked up. That's what makes a layer cake. If the vanilla crossed over with the mocha, and the mocha bled into the chocolate layer, and the caramel was just all over the place, you'd have a... You'd have, uh... Uh Uh-huh, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, with all those layers bleeding into one another, you'd have a tasty, but nonetheless screwed up layer cake. The deepest layer of an industrial plant, even deeper than the actual machines, is where safety instrumented systems, or SIS, lie, as well as any other physical mechanisms built into the machines to prevent equipment failure. Because failure of these systems can be deadly, there is nothing more important than keeping this layer protected. The next layer up from safety systems are where the machines and the machines that control the machines lie. We call this the Distributed Control System, or DCS. This is the heart of the plant's operation, what you picture when you're imagining what goes on at an industrial facility. Typically, the DCS and SIS layers are not supposed to be in communication unless the SISs require a special adjustment like a software update. There are a number of reasons to keep these layers separate. SISs are designed to act automatically without need for human input so that they can stay objective. And isolation prevents SISs from being easily tampered with by a remote attacker or even a malicious insider in the plant. Again, because safety systems prevent explosions, these precautions are critical. Next up from the DCS layer is the Demilitarized Zone, or DMZ. The DMZ is the protective layer, keeping what's behind it safe from the outermost layer, the IT network. Because IT systems connect to the internet, they are extremely vulnerable to incoming cyber attacks. The DMZ is designed to prevent those threats from borrowing their way 
into operational systems. A typical DMZ might include layered firewalls or unidirectional gateways that allow for only one direction of information flow, either blocking malicious information from coming in or preventing critical information from getting out. This is our layer cake. Each layer is distinct. The lower you go, the more critical your equipment gets. Therefore, lower layers are more secure than higher layers, and overlap between layers must be kept to the absolute minimum necessary to keep the plant running smoothly. A breach in any layer represents a vector for attacks to borrow downwards. Though it's best practice to keep every layer of an industrial network distinct, the reality is that most plants aren't perfect. This is especially true when security clashes with accessibility. Andrew Ginter. There's a, a, a compelling business need to uh, send information out of the system, to IT systems, to the internet, so that we can monitor what's going on. For example, if, if smoke rises out of one of the safety controllers, you kind of want to know that so you can replace it promptly. How do you know that? Well, it stops sending any information to the outside world. Oh, look, we stopped getting updates from one of the controllers. We should go and investigate. There's enormous value in monitoring industrial systems. But if monitoring comes at the cost of connectivity and potential attacks, we have a problem. If now we connect the safety system to the industrial control system and the industrial control system is connected to the demilitarized zone and the demilitarized zone is connected to the enterprise network and so on out to the internet, you've got a path of attack from the internet straight into the safety systems. This is why the advice that people are coming out with is saying, you know, instead of connecting all this stuff up like most people do, you really should start taking inspiration from really thoroughly secured industrial sites and don't do that. Either physically disconnect the safety networks so they cannot be reached from the internet. You have to walk over to the workstation if you want to use these things. Or, uh, you know, throw some unidirectional technology in there that lets you monitor the safety systems but is physically incapable of sending any information into those systems. No information gets in, no attacks get in. There's a clear and present cost to disabling all remote monitoring of plant operations. The cost of enabling remote monitoring is just as clear, but far less present. Petrochemical plants aren't hacked often. So can you blame the operators at Petrorabe for leaving open a window of communication between layers in their network? The, the, the sites I work with uh, never connect their safety systems to any network that can be reached from the internet directly or indirectly. And so this is something that the world's most secure, most cautious sites do. Um, mere mortals, the average site, yeah, sometimes they connect things up. So you could argue that, you know, these folks, some, some people will point the finger and say this was sloppiness. I'm not sure I'd go that far. This is what a lot of people do. The pathway that led from the internet to IT systems to its most sensitive internal systems was wide enough to allow a capable attacker direct access to the machinery. With that access, they went after the most sensitive machines in the entire facility. Petro Rabe used the Triconix brand of safety instrumented system, specifically the Tricon 3008 model, made by a French company called Schneider Electric. Triconix SISs have four modes of operation, which can be toggled via a physical switch. These four modes are remote, program, run, and stop. Remote is the least secure mode, allowing direct changes to the machine's code. Program is the mode you might use if you were a plant operator and needed to update the machine in some way. It allows you to load a control program onto the machine, which is then debugged and downloaded by the machine's internal software. Run is the mode which, in theory, should be active almost all of the time. It allows only read-only access so that plant operators can view but not alter the machine while it's in operation. Stop, as you might expect, stops the machine from running at all. 
We can only infer from afar as to why half a dozen SISs at Petro Rabe were left in program mode instead of run mode. It's unclear, too, why the other safety precautions built into Triconic systems didn't work, namely the ability to set password protection and IP-specific restricted access over certain functions of the machine. The hackers successfully loaded their own custom-built software onto the six vulnerable SISs. That program opened a backdoor through which they could then maintain consistent access to those machines. There was two pieces that were discovered. Uh, one piece tricked the safety system into what's called escalation of privilege, uh, which means it, the, 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 the job of this first piece of malware was to get, you know, some people call it root, some people call it admin, get control of the CPU, of the, the, the system, so thoroughly that the malware could do anything it wanted on the system. It had, you know, you had to get some power first, get some, some permissions. The escalation component of the attacker's software meant that even if the SIS were to have been switched from program into run mode at a later time, it wouldn't have affected their ability to upload new malicious data onto the machines. The other thing that piece of malware did was download the rest of the malware. The rest of the malware sat there in memory with permissions to do anything it wanted. And what it wanted to do was change the contents of memory. So it would take orders over a communications protocol to change this piece of memory or change that piece of memory. What can you do with that? Well, you can reprogram the safety system. You can change the, the, the limits the, you know, in memory that the safety system compares readings to. You can do anything you want to the safety system. It's worth reiterating here just how significant this point is. Even if the hackers did nothing to the Rabe safety systems, the mere fact that they demonstrated they could have was enough to change the entire future history of cybersecurity. Two and a half years later, it is still the number one malware on industrial security experts' minds. People have talked about this possibility for a long time about this class of attack. Um, this is the first example of this class of attack we've discovered in the wild. Um, it would appear that somebody was trying to sabotage the safety system. Um, why? We don't know. Maybe they wanted the ability to shut down the plant at their will. Well, they succeeded in that twice. Maybe they wanted something worse. If you impair the operation of the safety system, then when an unsafe condition occurs in the physical plant, the safety system no longer shuts down the plant. What happens when unsafe conditions occur? Well, there's explosions, there's toxic releases, there's releases of petrochemicals into the environment. Um, you know, in the worst case, it's possible to imagine uh, not just a disaster, but a catastrophe. The program that breached Petro Rabe was the first ever malware designed to kill humans. We call it Triton. Having discovered the most dangerous malware in the entire world, researchers were now left to pick up the pieces, to restore the Petro Rabe plant to working order and figure out what evil entity was behind Triton. But they had one thing to do before anything else. Even after discovering the Triton malware, the Triton hackers remained connected to Petro Rabe's internal systems. The security team had to remove Triton from their systems, but doing so would signal to the hackers that they'd been caught. At that point, anything could happen. This is where we'll pick up the story in our next episode, Triton Part 2.
thanks to this episode to our guest, Andrew Ginter. Industrial security isn't the most approachable subject out there, but if you're interested in learning more about Trident and the world of ICS security, Andrew's podcast might be the best place to start. Check out the Industrial Security Podcast, hosted by our very own Nate Nelson. Last time I asked you, our listeners, to tell us about your favorite AI characters from a movie, a TV show, or a book you read. We got some interesting answers, and then Sarah, who runs the Malicious Life Twitter account, had an interesting idea for another question, which got even more interesting answers. So let's start with your favorite AI characters. Vinny Kazi Kiewicz. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, wrote on Twitter, Master Control Program from Tron and GLaDOS from Portal, end quote. GLaDOS is also one of my favorite video game characters, right next to Cave Johnson from Portal 2. He's hilarious. Jeff from Texas wrote, quote, W-O-P-R. It got me into computing, demon dialing, and cybersecurity, end quote. I think I need to explain this for those of our listeners who are not 1980s kids. So first, you missed a great decade. And second, WOPR is War Operation Plan Response from the 1983 movie War Games starring Matthew Broderick. You're feeling old yet, Jeff? I sure am. Another oldie but goodie by Kevin from Walla Walla. Quote, my favorite AI... Johnny Five from Short Circuit. And he added a quote, Hey, laser lips, your mama was a snowblower. <laughs> On to a slightly more modern movie. Koi Zero wrote, quote, My favorite AI is Ava from the movie Ex Machina. And I wondered, once the AI passes the Turing test, what's next? Ava's programming allowed her to develop skills in self-preservation and social engineering. Sentience and consciousness is there, but what about her conscience? End quote. And lastly, Plastic Ward wrote Doors Venabili from the Foundation series with all the important laws of robotics. End quote. I don't know how many of you read Isaac Asimov as kids. I did. And he is the reason I'm an author today. Next, to the question Sarah had for you following our deep fake episodes. It was, would you listen to a podcast that is narrated fully by a deep faked voice? Assuming, of course, the voice quality is on par with that of a human. We ran a Twitter survey and the results were quite surprising, frankly, at least for me. 42% of the voters said, Yes, we will listen to a podcast narrated by a deep fake. 37% said they will listen, but only if it's exceptional. And only 20% said they won't listen to a deep fake. And here I was certain that you'll be loyal to us, your human podcast hosts. But no, some of you were already replacing me in your heads with other voices. For example, Insomniac from Sweden who wrote, quote, I, for one, would love to hear Christopher Walken, William Shatner, Gilbert Gottfried, and Arnold Schwarzenegger talk about malware, end quote. I tagged Arnold in the thread, but he didn't respond. So you're stuck with me, people. Infosec Goner wrote, quote, wouldn't mind listening to a podcast narrated by the Google Maps lady, although more than one episode would be probably too much, end quote. Crooked Cow wrote, quote, if it was narrated by Beavis and Butthead, then maybe, end quote. Come on, people, you're swapping me for Beavis and Butthead? Only Mike had the decency to at least say this is a complicated question. He wrote, quote, it would have to be on par with that of a human just for me to tolerate listening for up to an hour. But a good podcast is about so much more than just voice quality. So it's difficult to answer. End quote. Thank you, Mike. And by the way, Dan from the Isle of Wight wrote, quote, I was hoping you would have done a reveal that part two of Deepfakes was in fact narrated by a deepfake of you. End quote. 
Lily TQ wrote similarly, quote, I would sort of expected that the last pod had a part of it deep faked voice already, end quote. Well, to be honest, I tried. I played with a few apps and tools I found online, but I couldn't get them to work properly, probably because I didn't have enough time to really learn the ropes. But all kidding aside, I think deep faked voices will have a dramatic impact on podcasting and radio in general in a few more years. The future will be very, very interesting, to say the least. Follow us on Twitter at at Malicious Life for more interesting questions and discussions. My handle is at Ran Levy. That's at R-A-N-L-E-V-I. And I'm always happy to hear from you, be it feedback, suggestions, questions, or even if you just like to say you love the show. Our website is malicious.life, where you'll find all of our previous episodes as well as full transcripts. Malicious Life is produced by BI Media looking for someone to make your podcast dreams come true when it comes to challenging technology and complex science we are the experts talk to me at ran at ranlevy.com that's r-a-n at r-a-n-l-e-v-i dot com thanks again to cyber reason for underwriting the podcast learn more at cyber reason.com bye bye oh my god CK music, 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 music.